Hello, everybody. Welcome to an episode of Max Spoilers from MinMax. MinMax is a place about games, friends, and getting better. My name is Ben Hansen, but thank God I'm not alone. I'm joined by one Charles, Charles McGregor, the developer of HyperDot, dare I say. Hello. It is, you, you dare say that. I, I say it. Thank you for being here. Also joined by <laughs> yep. Jacob Geller. Hello. You know him from YouTube. It's like Mr. Beast and Jacob Geller. Um, that's Both really... North Carolinians. Oh, do we you know him? Do you we're hang out with him? We're practically neighbors. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> uh, I'm sure I'll talk about it somewhere, but I went down a, a Mr. Beast rabbit hole with Dan Reichert the other night where we just drank a lot and watched like hours and hours of Mr. Beast content. <laughs> not bad. I got to say, not bad. Uh, okay, here we go. This is a Max Spoilers discussion. Full spoilers for not a game, not your typical thing. Uh, this is for Max Spoilers for the development of Psychonauts 2 because we are unpacking Double Fine Psych Odyssey as part of the overall celebration of Psych Odyssey that we're doing here at MinMax. We have a week filled with content. So if you're just finding this, you haven't found the other stuff, please go check our interview with Two Player Productions about how this whole documentary was made. You can check out our Game Industry Roundtable discussion for more insight on this thing. Will this be the last of the celebration of Psych Odyssey? You tell me. Hopefully not. We'll see. Uh, but the thing is, if you enjoy this type of content and... Hopefully you aren't annoyed by it, but if you enjoy us leaning so hard into something that, again, is completely illogical for an outlet to do, to devote an entire week to covering a documentary released about a game's development, if you enjoy this type of weirdness, <laughs> you can help support it directly by going to patreon.com slash minmax with two N's. Find the tier that's right for you, and if you happen to choose that $5 tier, it's a real sweet spot because you unlock the podcast version of this, all of our other Max spoilers. You will unlock the podcast version of The Deepest Dive on Like a Dragon Ishin, with Jacob Geller is on, along with Michael Hyam, Leo Vader, Sarah Pazorski. It's very fun. You also get podcast access to The Deepest Dive on Resident Evil 4 Remake, which is going to be coming up very soon. So if you want to help support independent games media, we'd appreciate that. Go over and check out that site. It's patreon.com. Such min max with two ends. All right. Charles, um, thank you for being up for this. Like, I, I feel oh, like I've yeah. been screaming about Double Fine Psych Odyssey for a while and like, but everyone should watch it. Everyone, everyone should watch it. And uh, Jacob eventually finished it. It's awesome. Got through it. Uh, Charles McGregor also, like you were in the Slack channel being like, hey, by the way, I finished this. I'm ready to talk about it. Like, <laughs> yeah, oh, I already have another painting lined up. It. So I'm glad we have a spot. Like we've had people from the industry talk about it, uh, Double Fine talk about it. But it's like, oh, we should have people that are like, you know, more min-max regulars unpack their thoughts um, on this thing because there's certainly plenty more that we could say. So, Charles, uh, how long did it take you to get through this 32-part documentary? Uh, so I finished it in a week. Um, uh, I was... If if I had better timing, I probably would have pulled the same thing that you did. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if that's a weekend. better way to live your life, yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know if I would have uh, uh, really been able to consume and... Uh, <laughs> digest all of that at once but uh, i finished it throughout oh, an entire week so and your conclusion was my conclusion was uh i didn't know that i was in the presence of a a, a real movie star uh ben hansen oh uh, right yes. right right <laughs> that's right i consider myself a movie star because i was yeah, in the double yeah. fine so i got it it's very yeah. sweet and uh yeah it is I think I talked on some of the video, but it's just like every time well, there's like two instances where they show a podcast that I was on in that documentary. It's like literally just me holding my breath, like, don't say anything stupid. Don't say anything stupid. Don't, <laughs> don't stumble over your words, please. Don't be an asshole. Uh, don't be like one of those members of the press and those E3 demos who just sit there completely emotionless, stone faced. Like, I just wanted to scream during that part. Like, be a human. It's OK to be a human. You're not biased if you smile at a freaking joke in a Psychonauts game, everybody. Yep, well, it's very true. it's very funny because I think how you come across there is essentially how you have also come across in some of these interviews, which is being like, can we just talk about the fact that it's crazy this exists? It's and you were saying that about Psychonauts 2, and then we're spending a week <laughs> saying that about the, yeah, you know, the documentary is. as well. I am challenged um, by trying to talk about something that I'm so passionate about, like this documentary. Like I feel like every discussion we've had for the celebration of Double Fine Psych Odyssey I feel like it's mostly just me being like, oh, it's so it's so wild and like not getting any good points across. Like there's some point where you can just kind of over prepare and be over hyped for something. It's not mm -hmm. it's not right. Um, OK, so let's see. Movie star stuff. But then, Charles, you're, you're a yeah. freaking game developer. Um, oh, yeah. But you mainly work with uh, smaller teams. So is it kind of like a little bit uh, Greg's perspective from uh, the development of Chicory and the roundtable where it just it opened your eyes to working with a larger team? Um, yeah, a, a little bit where I felt like. 
So, okay. I'm already like a, a fairly big fan of uh, the Double Fine Adventure yeah. uh, documentary. Um, in fact, there's actually a uh, Easter egg inside of Hyperdot. Um, one of the levels names is called Reds, which is the oh, really? code oh, name fun. for uh, Broken Age. Yeah. And I was like, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll totally do that. Um, <laughs> so like I'm already a fan of like this entire process. So I already knew how this goes and like all the Amnesia Fortnites and stuff. Um, and and like. It's not necessarily a one to one like, oh, yes, I clearly have the exact same problems that you have. No, uh, but um, it is it is definitely a uh, an issue of scale where yeah. I have uh, I've been in a very fortunate uh, position where I would have like also had like I've had uh, experiences with E3. Uh, I've talked to Microsoft uh, and all these things. And it was like a weird thing of me being able to uh, try and track what like, oh, yeah, these are kind of similar. Right, like, right. If you blew this up like 1000 <laughs> times, right, this right. would be kind of in the the realm of maybe this kind of could be similar. Well, does that apply uh, also to like um, interpersonal stress, which believe it or not is kind of the, the theme of the documentary of like, okay, I've yeah. had I've had development struggles interpersonally just with our games. Yeah, and that one, uh, mine's lesser so because like for Hyperdot, that one's less of a thing because it right. would be just be like me going back and forth being like, no, I think that this should be named this. Yeah, uh, full Gollum material, yeah. Yes, <laughs> yes, my precious. There are there are some times where I uh, were, was getting in like arguments about certain things with uh, my publishers at, at Glitch. And I was like, oh no, I want this to be uh, a, a certain way. And I should have totally backed down on a lot of those. <laughs> <stuff. laughs> That's the lesson uh, immediately backed down. <laughs> yeah. Um, but no, it's just, it's, uh, I mean, like you've been saying all week, it's just like a monumental feat that yeah. this has been released and is out there. And like, uh, it's, inspiring and like harrowing <laughs> like at the same time where yeah. i'm like uh it is it is so um it's so insightful and it's it it inspires me to just like i really enjoy just seeing people like in their element doing their thing uh and like learning their process and how they go about stuff and like this this has this in spades yeah um but like it's also like yeah like you're you're saying like the drama, the heft of all of the decisions, the uh, interpersonal uh, communications and, and all this stuff, like it makes it like the difference between how I felt at the end of the Double Fine Adventure versus how I felt at the end of this uh, was just so it was so different where I felt like I would like I've watched the Double Fine Adventure uh, like three times some yeah. four times maybe um but like this one i'm like i'm gonna need to have some space uh, right after this <laughs> yeah i definitely so, yeah. i can see rewatching this maybe yeah a year from now six months from now something like that and just going back and i mean i yeah. i took so many stupid pages of notes about this document there's moments that i'm like oh this sequence is so good it's like i, I should have put a timestamp on that so i can just jump right back to that because trying to start through <laughs> to find out 22 hours of footage is kind of tricky but yeah jacob keller we talked about it on the min max show podcast uh when you were like uh, eight episodes in or something like that. I'm trying to remember where you were mm -hmm. exactly, but now that you've finished it, what's your... Give yeah, me your, I was, your I was still in the rhombus of ruin when we mm -hmm. uh, originally mm -hmm. talked. Merely a babe, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, I it, it, it's so fascinating for me as someone who uh, is not a developer and has really no, like, pretensions of ever wanting to, like, do game development. Mm -hmm. um, but the main thing that it has made me think about is just, like... I, I I hope that I can give and take criticism well yes. and has been recognizing that like it is so hard to know if that is what you're doing in the moment. Right. You know, that right. is that it's it's almost impossible to kind of correctly understand how something will be taken or how you are taking what something else someone else is telling you mm -hmm. like at the time because I, my kind of overwhelming feeling through all of this was just like 
I can only understand these dynamics in retrospect, you know, and sure. like if I was in that room, I would have no idea how to navigate any of this either. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's, <laughs> believe it or not, what's so unbelievable about this documentary is it's just, it's a lesson on humanity that I rarely get from media, you know, and it's, sure. it, it also just reminds me of, this is a weird comparison, but it reminds me of like, you know, Nathan Fielder's The Rehearsal, where like at the end of it, it's like the takeaway is just, God, people's brains and life is complicated. And when we're so used to media just trying to focus everything in and pretty clear black and white terms, especially documentaries, you know, just to have a documentary that leaves you just being like, poof. <laughs> okay, yeah. it's so hard to understand where any other person's coming from at any moment in time with their brain and their perspective and their life experience. Like, how often does a piece of media leave you with that takeaway of just like <laughs> humans, huh? You know, it's, yeah. it's pretty rare for this scope of something to really have that impact. And Jacob, I know, just to go fully behind the scenes here, um, and out your dirty Slack messages, but you sent me that Slack message and you're just like, I. Like, I, I worry about treating these people like characters because it's so easy to yeah. do it and it feels gross to do it. But when you're presented a documentary, everyone wants to slip into that role of calling these people characters, mm -hmm. heroes and villains. Like, you want to just talk about, like, wrestling with that? Yeah, well, and, and one of the things that um, I think you did, you did the admiral jo a job of asking. I'm not sure if you got exactly the answers you wanted, but when you were talking to two-player productions. Right, right. Kind of being, like, because the the thing is when you have 5000 hours of footage it's like you have to pick kind of threads and mm -hmm. and i do think that the mission of a documentary is to kind of create an arc out of something like just life which mm -hmm. doesn't necessarily have an arc and so they do like they do kind of pick people i think to be like we're focusing on them you're going to see how this evolves and that happens over time but it also happens as a function of which documentary clips we are choosing and not choosing to show in which order. And mm -hmm. so like, it is just, you know, this is true of all documentaries, but there's so much captured here that it really stood out to me, this idea of kind of like creating character arcs out of real life people or refusing to do that, or, you mm -hmm. know, just kind of like wrestling with, that question have you seen here's my media reference um have you either of you watched uh american vandal no the mm. netflix crime mockumentary show no i haven't um genuinely my favorite netflix original of course it was canceled after two seasons yeah, um course. but it's it's like it's a it's a fake you know it's in the vein of like making a murderer or something but about a fake crime that happened at a high school and where it ultimately ends is this very kind of like self interrogating. What is the role of a documentarian in like shaping the stories that people understand about themselves? Mm -hmm. um, oh, and, and I was just like, I was thinking about that and <laughs> this, this show is about people spray painting dicks on teachers cars and yet it ends in that place. So it's, it's <laughs> okay. an incredible piece of work. Yeah. Um, there were the I figments just, of imagination about... that kind of look like the dicks in Psychonauts 2 in that one chunk. So it's, it's relatable, <laughs> right. I think it's basically one to one. <laughs> um, yeah, but just, just kind of like, you know, the, I get the, since the whole theme of it is like humans are complex and hard to understand <laughs> right. and the whole mission of media is generally like we're going to boil down complexities into something that you can understand yeah. right those two things seem almost in conflict and i don't mean that in a negative way but just in like a i think that's why we're also obsessed with it yeah that's exactly right it's just i you know we have a whole channel in the minmax discord unpacking it and i'm fascinated just seeing people's thoughts and it's a lot about like it's a lot of villains. Like, I think this person's a villain. I think this person's the villain. Oh, hang on. Uh, God's oh. telling me that I'm the villain, apparently. I'm going to go adjust my <laughs> light. Um, but let me finish this point first. But I think I think it's just, you know, reality TV has taught us a little bit about that. I mean, Survivor has seasons that they call heroes versus villains. And it, it's just like to take a documentary and to take a slice of life of developing Psychonauts 2. And then it's so fascinating to just filter that through. I don't want to go into full culture wars territory, but it's a little bit of that idea of just like, okay, everyone's got a battle. You got to pick your sides. Let's go. Right. Like mm -hmm. trying to channel mm -hmm. it even through like Star Wars lens. Who's light side, dark side. It's like, it, 
no, everybody. Yeah. It's like, there's yeah. an overall lesson here. Let me adjust this light here. You, uh, oh you go on, Charles. Make a great point while I'm gone. Okay. Yeah, no problem. Uh, so actually, um, I, like, I totally agree with you where it's like, it's this weird, uh, it's this weird mix of you're, you're, I mean, yeah, you're watching and consuming this documentary. Uh, and throughout the entire time that I was watching uh, and consuming it, I was also in the back of my head trying to not make them characters. And not <laughs> right. Be right. like, oh, yeah, these like, you know, I can't wait for next episodes so that I don't like, you know, all this other stuff. And like, uh, it's a weird, like parasocial uh, thing that you might also experience um, where, again, like I have been extremely fortunate uh, within my career uh in 2017 or is it 16 16 or 17 one of those ones um i was fortunate enough to actually go to the double fine offices oh awesome uh, as like a tour it was just like in a touring sense and the experience was horrible because i felt like i was well one i felt like i was uh we were being quartered around to different uh, parts of the office and stuff and people were working in things when it, and it felt like, huh, this feels weird. I know who you are because I've watched all the Amnesia of Fortnite things and right, the double right. fine adventure and stuff. Uh, but I don't know how to like, well, one, I know you don't know who I am, uh, but <laughs> two, but two uh, like, I don't like, I know you through a lens of like, yeah, just the things that I have saw, or seen on uh, the the documentaries right, right. Uh, and stuff. And I don't know how to approach you on that. Also, I don't want to approach you because you're working <laughs> and you're, you're busy. Yeah. Um, and like, it felt like it kind of felt like I was in a zoo kind of thing. Like I was <laughs> spectating and I was looking yeah. at things and I was like, this feels so wrong. Right. It goes uh, people, so, characters, animals. Is that uh, <laughs> what <laughs> like reality has done to people through a documentary lens? Yeah, it's it's not necessarily because at that point when you're watching the documentary, they're definitely still people. But like. When mm -hmm. you start to get to like now we're just, when now we're gonna be in like interacting slash right. we are now in the realm of which this should be a person like people interacting together sure um it can become it like it can feel like you're no longer talking about people yeah uh, because you have like a character caricature of whatever they are and it's not necessarily they are a caricature of whatever they are right because they're. I mean, there's a lot of footage in this in this documentary. Um, it's just you have one aspect of things and it makes it really apparent um, that you have one one perspective mm -hmm. of things, even though it's like a more omniscient uh, perspective. Right. Uh, it's one not of, completely. One of the most interesting parts of the whole thing for me, and it was like if I was making this. It, you know, if I was the documentarian and I was like less of a passive observer, I would have made this a point or something. But at the end, they're talking to James and they're like, yeah. how how did this, you know, how did this feel? What did you expect? Like, what did you do? And he basically says that, like, he feels like Double Fine kind of got away from what he saw in the Double Fine adventure. And maybe mm -hmm. they would be able to get back to that with yep. future projects yep. and i saw that and i was like you are having your idea of, like the parasocial version of right. double fine crash right. into the real one you right. know and it's right. like like you, you know there there is a cut of the double fine adventure you know i don't want to say which of the projects was worse or not but it's like there's a cut of the Devil Fine Adventure that would have made it look miserable, you know, because mm -hmm. that's how that's how documentaries work. And I do think that this project had challenges that that one didn't and whatever. But wow. I just thought it was it was so fascinating that he had a concept of the studio that mm -hmm. he had formed from watching a documentary. And then when showing up to the document or showing up to the studio, it was different. And his kind of thought was like the studio culture has changed and not like reality is different than the documentary. Uh, it, mm. But uh, in contrast to that, I think it's interesting that I think so much of this documentary, especially early on, it's trying to recapture that kind of early enthusiasm for game development. And you look at people like a Scott Campbell or a Bagley, or even like, I think Anna to some extent, like a lot of those mm -hmm. old timers that were there at the start of the studio. And they also feel like, you know, 
yeah. very nostalgic for that earlier day and thinking like this doesn't feel the way it did before and they weren't looking at it through a documentary you know no but they like yeah, but they were they there. know from experience <laughs> right, and, right. and james yeah. you know kind of knows quote unquote from a documentary yeah. and i just like it's it, it's so wild to have like generations raised on a perception of Double Fine coming to work at Double Fine, which is, mm-hmm. you know, not true of the old timers. Yeah. I mean, so much of this documentary is about, you know, you're fighting the nature of the studio. What is the studio and what can we push on? Like that discussion between James and Anna uh, talking about like combat in the game and her oh, just trying man. to be like, that's it's not the way we do things at Double Fine. It's like, like I know I'm trying to. I'm trying to make it better. I'm trying to make the combat a good thing in this game. It's like, yeah, but the way you're going about this, it's just, it's not what we do. And just like that, that one little discussion in that side meeting room, I feel like is just kind of an encapsulation of so much of the documentary. Like, I, I see what you're trying to do, but it's, you're fighting the nature of the beast and the beast is inherently sloppy and you can't clean it up. You just, and if you do it, there's going to be tension. And then there's tension for a thousand different reasons, you know? Yeah. Um, we had people submit comments uh patreon supporters from minmax they submitted uh comments and thoughts and questions because everyone's trying to process this documentary uh very appropriate dean b writes in and says hey who's your favorite character no <laughs> they, 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 to be fair oh, to dean they put it in quotes they say who's your favorite character from the doc and why isn't it gigi gigi's funny there's no doubt there's no doubt she's very funny uh did you all like connect with somebody more not even like oh they're the best but just somebody's like oh this mm-hmm. this "Quote unquote" storyline is is really engaging my brain. Uh, yes, every time that Asif showed up, yeah. I was just like, "Yes, oh. ding ding ding!" <laughs> yes, I was just like, "Yeah," the entire like because I uh, I actually watched part of uh, the 2017 Amnesia Fortnite. I haven't yep. watched the like the full one, okay, uh, largely because it's weird streaming things, and it's really was a hassle for me to be able to stream the entire thing. So I only watched part. Anyway. Um, so I knew that like, yeah, he was going to be the person, uh, or he was going to be one of the people, uh, to lead the thing, uh, and stuff. And I knew he was like super stressed out about it. And he like put on like, oh, this is going to be the last time I'm going to ever do this. And like, everybody else is going to actually go to that. And like, but like to see his arc to go from that to like, oh, this is, this is my only shot to, yeah, now I'm working on Psychonauts too. And I'm like. Like my my idea is like an entire level in that game. Right. I just every time I just was like standing and applauding. It was so nice. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, and and my love of just the kind of like meta narrative of this whole thing of just him, you know, coming in front of the camera and me thinking like he knows better than anyone yes, else yes. what mm. being filmed means and he mm-hmm. is you know like as much as you know in in your interview he said i look at the person in that documentary and it doesn't even really feel like me it feels like a different person but i'm pretty sure that like when he was in front of the cameras he was thinking about the interviews that he's done and how they are edited and mm-hmm. all of that stuff and yep. just kind of having the movement from behind to in front of the camera in the middle of this seven year journey Mm -hmm. is just so like formally interesting. Yeah. And it's, it's easy to project yourself into his shoes because it's like, he has had a weird bird's eye view for the development as well. You know, Mm -hmm. basically mirroring our perspective on the overall development and understanding the different people and personalities and stuff. So like him, kind of jumping in the trenches you're like now i'm gonna try designing a level you just it's so easy to connect and just think like okay he can bring this team together he knows what's bugging everybody in this group he can finally <laughs> unite the realm and you know it turns out it's complicated you know yeah so i don't think he was going on a crusade to say okay here's what you said here's and here's what you said here you know <laughs> We can compromise and synergize. Right, be right. Great. He, he <laughs> yeah. barely said synergize, and that's his main problem, I think, as a game Yeah, there it is. Uh, Virgil B. writes in, they say, the credits for Psychonauts 2 have a lot more impact after watching Psych Odyssey. Knowing the names of the people scrolling by and their roles and what they went through to make the game, it makes the act of watching credits more engaging. I got to the point where I was actively looking for some names to come up. That is, I mean, that's that's the magic that's of this awesome. era of Double Fine, you know? It's like feeling yeah. more connected to, to everybody, and it's to the point... And this is where you know that it's it's not healthy or accurate, but like 
when I see somebody like, I don't know, on Twitter or something who works at Double Fine, I'm like, I don't know them. I, there's a part of me that's like, who is this imposter? You know, he's like, I've barely <laughs> seen them on camera because there's, you know, they, they pointed out, but there's so many people that they could have mm -hmm. highlighted that are just in a couple shots here and there in the background and stuff like that. And so. Mm -hmm. Well, and I've had, uh, just in the past couple of days, I've started playing Psychonauts 2 oh. again, which, which I fell off of. Um, and it's, it's really kind of funny to have, you know, with this experience. It's like when I first started playing, I was like, this is clever. I like the design. It, it, the game is just kind of, you know, it doesn't feel polished enough for me oh, or whatever that, that it just mm. felt like there was kind of like weird air in all the scenes and whatever. Oh, that's right. You went on the podcast, it, you kept screaming lazy devs, lazy devs. I remember yeah, that, this time. You know, uh, I'm notorious okay. for that. Uh -huh. um, but now playing it, I, you know, I am just, I'm still feeling the same things, but I'm just like, this is a miracle. Look at, <laughs> look at, how, look at how good this art looks. Look at how right. one level goes into the next level. They did it. Right. Yeah. Which is like, honestly, it's the reason that I, when I am writing about a game, I do not try to interview devs or like, you know, find mm. out kind of like what they've talked about with their experiences, mm -hmm. because I do feel like it's, it's fundamentally impacting my experience and, and oh, in a way that hundred. I'm really enjoying, but in a way where it's like, I could not review this game now, right. you know, <laughs> like I am totally kind of like, I, I, my brain is just in a totally different realm than how I usually think about games. Yeah, sure. no, I, I a hundred percent agree. I, I've had that experience again. I feel like I, I'm kind of tooting my own horn here, but um, yeah, when I, so when Hyperdot was like, uh, particularly when Hyperdot was released on Game Pass, um, and I I would just pop in on random streams of people playing the game, uh, and there was this one time where there was a person who was like streaming. They got to like, I think they were at like level ninety something. They were like really at the end of the the game, and I was like, oh hey, thanks for playing the game. I really appreciate it. And then they didn't believe that was the, the developer. Somebody in chat verified, and it was great. Um, but uh, when I said, yeah, it was, yeah, it was just me. I'm the, I'm the solo developer. It like completely changed the way in which that they talked about the game yep, when yep. they were like, oh, I thought that this was like a cash grab or whatever for this thing. And also I was like, I made it to level 90 of a cash. grab." <laughs> <laughs> I, I was like, oh, OK, um, but like it changed their perspective. And I yep. like that is that is something that totally happens to me where, yeah, when I when I play a game where I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, this is, this is nice. But then when I know the person behind the game mm -hmm. or like I, I have followed the development of said game for uh, a long time, actually uh, there was a, a recent game, Clive and Wrench, uh, which is a game that uh, recently came out. Like, yeah. I believe it was, it's like a uh, platformer. Old. Yeah. It's a 3d collect right. platformer. Um, but I've been following that development for nine years. Yeah. Or something like that. It Like, yeah, in 2014 was when I first found out about that. And like, because I know that, like, it hits different than it would if I just was like, oh, I'm just going to play this random yep. game. You're... I don't know anybody behind this Yep, uh, and stuff. And like, yeah, that like that experience. And I can totally uh, understand where you're coming from. We're like, how can I review this game now? <laughs> where I'm like, I yeah. now know uh some some level of like how the the sausage was made so I, I, I and like this is totally influencing what i'm thinking about the game and it's a it's a tough line to walk trying to figure out like okay you want to have empathy for these people that made this game you want to appreciate what they did and you know it's nice to have a full picture and perspective on how this thing came to be you know but then i always think of <laughs> jeff cork back at game informer where he just he just he would always have the rebuttal every time like he was like reviewing a game or something and you know, I don't, I don't know where or how it would come up, but every time I bring up, like, yeah, but this game, like, the creative director left, like, halfway through, and it's actually a really challenging development. He would just be like, not my problem. Not, like, I understand <laughs> that, but not my problem. I am playing this game that people are spending money on, and that's all mm. I can focus mm. on. I can't focus on... I mean, and I think, yeah. uh, you know, honestly, it just speaks to the need for in-games media there to be writing that is not reviews. Yes. You know, that, yes. that, yep. that a review is kind of... 
I acknowledge it's important. I also think it's kind of the most boring form of writing that you can do about a game. And so it's like once you move past, is this good? Like, should you buy it? Then you can have these conversations that I think are way more interesting about, you know, you, you can be a connoisseur of context. You can really <laughs> oh, understand that's it. right. Blank check. Uh, d- op, OP Supreme. Op su- sub. Op Subprime, I assume there's some Transformers thing in here. Anyways, Op Subprime uh, on Patreon, they say, Hey, would y'all want to see a studio like Double Fine ever attempt another game as or more ambitious than Psychonauts 2? And do you think the nature of studios precludes them from being successful at creating games at that scale? Personally, what the hell do I know, but... I just feel like never make a game as big <laughs> this big again, Double Fine. <laughs> no. Please just keep making smaller stuff, please for the love of God. But you know what? There's millions of people out there who love Psychonauts too, and they probably would want them to make another one. So who am I to judge? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's kind of, it's tough because it's like, I wish they could, I kind of want the, the ambition and just like half of the scale, if Mm. that's possible, you know, it's like, if you could have just made Psychonauts like half as long, because I do love, you know, like, I, I I think it's I, I love all the parts of it, and I do think it would be a shame if we only saw kind of like little kind of indie size things from them again. But yeah, just seeing how it's made and seeing all of the lives that had to go into it, uh, yeah. it's it's hard to want. I mean, here's here's something that that you can t- you talked about a little with the uh, the other games kind of media and developers, mm-hmm. but I want to talk about is what you heard about other studios while watching this documentary mm, where yeah. they were talking about like at gearbox this is what Z- this mm-hmm. is what happens yeah. and and essentially zach's whole demeanor which you kind of understood like you know what this is probably what it takes to make a game like Passion i don't two. know assassin's creed odyssey oh. you know some something that is just like colossal and has a million Huge. parts and you can't understand how it could all fit together and it's like well i guess what that takes is that designers and programmers are on different floors and only a very specific subset of people have creative input and right. then everyone else just does what they just say doing. yeah and and so it's like you know that's that's how those games get made and as we've learned with devil fine it's like that's just not what anyone is there for yeah i, I mean it's interesting too thinking about I think right before this where the documentary starts Zach was at Harmonix for years um, and I believe he's working on some like unannounced projects projects that got canceled so like you know again just trying to think of like full perspectives like okay he worked on like Bioshock 2 then he was struggling to run up a hill with a bunch of projects at Harmonix in Boston and then that falls apart doesn't quite happen so like he was coming in extra hot for like let's get stuff done and like that just mm. fired him up even more in a way that conflicted but yeah the other studios thing i think was so fascinating even like at a certain point when the second uh anna came in <laughs> the second gameplay programmer and she was talking about like this is what i love about this documentary he's just like, i guess it's you could call it gossipy or whatever but i just love her just sharing her perspective of like you know like nether realm i was there it was just bro city like everyone was so bro in that place mm. and this is what i respect about double fine is it feels a little bit different and yeah, I mean, there's a moment, too, where Amy talks about, like, you know, just being heartbroken at the sale and even have that, like, rewind zoom in on her reaction with the acquisition uh, of micro, you know, Microsoft acquiring Double Fine and her just being like, I came here to work at an independent studio. And, like, it is just souring me so much, this idea that now we're technically owned by Microsoft. And is, that pushing. is a scene that. You know, sometimes people, I feel like, post post gifts of like, uh, you know, TV shows or whatever, where it's just like, watch this, watch every character's yes. reaction because yes. they're all interesting mm-hmm. and different. And it's like I could watch that announcement to the acquisition thing thirty times and just watch <laughs> like. everyone in the studio's face and be like, what are they? What do they look like mm-hmm. right now? Mm-hmm. Kind of how are they taking this news? Yep, yep. Even I love like having the mic on Greg Rice beforehand, you just hear him talking to somebody on the couch, like, don't worry, don't worry, it's good news. Just like trying to yeah. like whisper and calm people down because like, all right, if it's a group meeting, it's just going to feel terrible until you know exactly what's going on here. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, yeah, Charles, any any wisdom on that acquisition? What'd you yeah. think of that whole sequence? <laughs> um, that I mean, that entire sequence, really, it, it kind of uh, touches on the, uh, the question, uh, the initial question about this, uh, is that I... I would be totally fine if they had some like a game that this ambitious or more as long as they have the resources. 
if they have the resources to like do their thing, like the thing that they want to do uh, and not like they are constantly trying to push a rock up a mountain. Yeah. That is just on top of another mountain <laughs> of another thing. Um, like I would, I would be like, Oh yeah, I don't want to like stifle your, like your creative energy to be like, Oh no, I don't want you to work on anything big ever again. Um, and like the acquisition is like this weird thing where it's like it financially frees you up to do that. But like, like, uh, like you said with like Amy, like people, people wanted to be there to be independent. Yeah. Um, and like, that is, that is something that is, uh, it's not, it's not like it's super like, Oh yeah, it's just like clear cut and dry. As long as if they have Microsoft stuff and Microsoft is super hands off, we're totally Mm -hmm. cool. Um, because I, I forget who says it in the documentary, but like, uh, it's really about the people, uh, in charge because Microsoft's pe- like yep. organization can change yep. and then suddenly now it's no longer like that. Right. Um, right. Uh, and I think the, I mean, the, the idea of resources is so interesting because Microsoft acquires them and you know, they don't have infinite money, but it seems like they have kind of as much money as you need. And at parts I was like. You know, I was thinking just hire more people, but then you see like so many of the conflicts come from having more people, you right. know, and and making this bigger. And so it's like the the issues that they were running into were not money based and it wasn't, you know, it's like they could have hired more employees maybe, but like yeah. that would have kind of compounded their problems exactly uh, in this way where you just kind of felt that the impossibility of like what do we do here you know another yeah. thing where it's just like i don't have the answer even in even in hindsight like i cannot say w- what i would have done that would have like fixed this yeah 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 even yeah from this like third party view of everything and being like after after witnessing <laughs> this seven year long journey and being like okay these are all like and like uh absorbing all that i wouldn't be able to tell you like this is exactly what you need in order to solve these issues that you had uh, and stuff. And like, that would be the thing that I would want to be able to solve before saying like, yeah, I would love for you to work on your Mm -hmm. super ambitious project because then you could work on it without that like level of stress and tension and all this other stuff that uh, it came with. But like, it also came uh, because, um, throughout the entire thing you also still see like levity and uh like fun and stuff and it's just it, like i mean like it said it's all the human experience and right. super complex and whatnot yeah i uh, i went back and uh i made a video a while ago about the development of pokemon snap like piecing together old interviews oh, yeah. and stuff and it quotes from wada and miyamoto um and i went back and watched it not too long ago and i forgot there's a whole section where they're trying to build up a studio where the original idea with Pokemon Snap is like it was Miyamoto and um, Awada and the creator of Earthbound, Itoi, and they're like, hey, we want to make this studio. Just make whatever you want. Make something that weird. Make a bomb, and if it explodes and it's good, that's great. And if it explodes and it's bad, that's great. But just swing big, make something weird is kind of their vision for the studio, I think, in Tokyo. Um, and they said that, like, the team just could not rally. They could not get it done. It was just a disaster until that point of, like, okay, you know what, just... Put Pokemon in it, make a Pokemon snap. Let's just get something out the door, right? But uh, at a certain point in in an interview, an old interview, Miyamoto talked about how uh, <laughs> that the problem with the studio was the development team. And he said that democracy is at fault for game development gone wrong. Uh, quote, democracy is an excuse used by irresponsible people <laughs> when it comes to game development. And I thought about that a lot in this documentary. Like, it seems like that is the push and pull. It's like, yeah, but more people want to say. It's like... Yes, we want to respect that. Also, if everybody has a say, this thing is not getting done, and it's yeah. Going to I mean, hey, look, that people make games documentary on Valve, right? Uh, you know, yes, it's, exactly. It's a very interesting kind of similar thing. Well, especially mm-hmm. considering you know, like Brad Muir uh, went on left Double Fine to go work at Valve then, and like that, you know, Brad Muir is probably one of my favorite people in the documentary, even if he's just in the start of that that Rhombus of Ruin stuff. But I didn't even know that he worked on Rhombus of Ruin. But that entire sequence of that was fascinating like seeing him lead meetings being the project leader early on for rumbus ruin and then like watching tim watch him manage a room and then even like when he left and there was that line which is just like again we don't know anything right but tim Schafer had that line where he's just like you know like brad and i 
we've worked together a long time and we've had all different types of relationships, but the last six months have been good. And it's like, mm-hmm. that's, that's interesting because they're two of like, from our perspective, like, oh, the smiley fun guys. But it's like, eh, yeah. not that easy. People are not that easy, right? Um, but like that scene in particular, oh God, it just, it kills me. And it's such a small moment. But when they're struggling with Rama's ruin and they need more programmers and everything, and then there's that moment where they make some reference to like, okay, well, Double Fine is putting more money into Headlander. They're putting their own money into Headlander, the game that's published by, I think, Midnight City at that time. And you see Brad just being like, what? Like, like it's just so fascinating and bizarre to be able to see like an employee just be like, what call is our management making? Like, boy, do I disagree with that call. Um, and then he leaves after that. I'm not saying it's a one-to-one, but just that entire Brad Muir saga is fascinating. So I hope he's doing well in the democratized abyss of Valve up there. Who knows, right? Yeah, I mean, I used to, uh, when I worked in an office in like a totally uh, non-gaming-oriented field, it was, you know, it was a place where it was like, I really liked the whole place. I liked my coworkers. I thought the CEO was like good, but like it was a thing where uh, it felt like everything that we were trying to do had to be filtered through Mm. one person, which was the CEO. And we would have so many meetings being like, we still haven't heard anything so i don't know like i i don't know what mm. we're doing and and watching watching so many of those meetings especially where they were like tim's not here so like i don't know oh. what we're gonna do it, yeah. it was just like i was having flashbacks <laughs> to those of just being and it's like that's you know it was not a high stress environment where i worked but it was like i recognize that you know that yes. is not that's not a video game thing this is just yep. like strategies of leadership yeah. yeah, I think that that is probably the thing that is um, the most relatable uh, because I also have had that uh, experience where like working with a client and like I'm working with a small team of people and then we have the client and we're like, OK, well, everything that we do, we have to talk to the client and like anything, any of our suggestions or things we're like, we got to. What if we try and make it in a way in which we uh, like the client is like, oh, yeah, this is this is a great idea or like this is totally my idea. And we're like, yeah, it totally was or something like that. And like seeing that kind of uh, that you can see it on people's faces of like, yeah, I I don't know. I don't we got to like get approval for this. Right. Right. Uh, And stuff like that, especially uh, earlier on the the conversations that i just thought were so interesting was like i don't know if they if they specifically said this but they were essentially about like the the ineffable charisma of like who people want to listen to and who yes, don't yes. because like mm-hmm, you know mm-hmm. i i don't think that tim Schafer comes off as a particularly good game director in this but yeah. you do get the sense that it's like people just respect what he thinks and has to say and his input in a way where it's like he can say things and people listen and it makes sense in a way that just other people in this documentary are kind of not able to and it's just kind of like is it is it just because we know his history is it Mm -hmm. because he has this kind of like undescribable aura that just makes people want to listen to him is it just because you know he's their biggest boss it's really it's they're fans like, of his games from back i don't in think the day. anyone yeah. knows the answer but seeing people kind of grapple with that especially seeing like zach grapple with that is <sighs> is really uh, kind of fascinating yeah i mean it's literally yeah tim has that whole sequence where he talks about like trying to unpack the nature of authority and as i get some people just reject the people above them and like what is that and steven seeing him trying to unpack it. But then, I mean, the most fascinating, well, I've probably said that about 7,000 things, but the most fascinating thing about this documentary (laughs) is I just love then when it's like, all right, I mean, it went a year without a project leader for this game, which is mind boggling. And then when Tim was kind of like, you know what? Okay, yeah, I I, I guess I am the project lead. Sure, I'm the lead on Psychonauts 2, everybody. Here we go. Um, Then seeing like, you know, again, it's editing, I understand. But seeing people a little bit turning on Tim, like the Tim bashing starts to go up. It's like, okay, he's, held his hand in the air and said, it's all coming down to him. Now I'm going to start questioning some things here and there and get extra frustrated with him. Or like, you know, you see him even get frustrated when he comes to the meeting. He's like, you guys, you have to call me if you have this kind of meeting. Like, I need to be in the loop on this type of thing. You can't just make these calls without me. So it's like, even Tim is not immune to it by the end. It's all it's all a tricky relationship with authority. Yeah. Um, so uh, Linwood in the Patreon there 
They say, excluding friends, family, and the need for basic survival skills, um, is there anyone else you'd rather be stranded on an island with than Tim Schafer? <laughs> Seems like you could figure out how to make any bleak scenario at least a little funny. Okay, so excluding friends, family, and any survival skills. Uh, sure, I'll go with Tim Schafer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when we take out a you whole know, bunch uh, of people. Yeah, yeah, I guess Bear Grylls is out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah I, I, I don't think Tim Schafer would last long. Sir, that seems like a great choice. Well, but here's, here's the thing. You think about being on that island, and you're like, Tim, do you think we should build a raft? And Tim's like, and you're looking at his face and trying to figure like, out if he thinks like, that you think you, you should, should build a raft. <laughs> you're like, we should probably build this raft. Huh? Right. <laughs> yeah. But is it raft article enough? I don't know if it's really. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Uh, yeah, that oh, one of the most amazing little bits, too, is Tim when he's just talking about. He's like, you know, sometimes I am joking and sometimes I'm super serious. And he says, that's why some people hate working with me. I would. Yep. And like, like to him have it laid out like that, like, yes, that is what yeah. is frustrating because you're a joke guy and I get this. Um, but sometimes that hurts. And like when mm -hmm. Andy, the producer, is leaving and he's calling Benedict Arnold and all that stuff, it's like, this hurts me. I can't imagine how Andy mm -hmm. feels from this. Mm -hmm. Like, it sucks. Um, I thought, I mean, it's like this was, uh, again, a kind of like outside inside perspective thing. I've seen Tim Schafer speak at like award shows, do other things before, but I was always kind of in in the number of like public appearances that he had in that seeing him go up. I was like, oh, my God, he's so good. You right. know, like yep. like when he was like announcing that like Microsoft acquired them and seeing like, you know, the bit that he does being like, wow, he sells this so well. <laughs> and then thinking about being in that office and having these like frustrating meetings or conversations with him and then you know like like seeing essentially that version of tim which like everyone has is just mm -hmm. their their more public facing persona but thinking about working there and kind of trying to fit those things together as well and mm -hmm. being like look he's so like he's so charismatic and fun up there can we have some of that in our meetings or can he like tell us what to do or whatever i just think you know again you feel like you know everyone so well that then seeing the public facing side mm -hmm. even though the whole documentary is public facing it, it feels like again you're seeing a new a new part of them yeah, yeah. And, and i love like just like those little cheeky moments in a tense meeting where people do still appreciate tim's sense of humor like at some point, there's a meeting in that side room, and Lisette is there, the art director, and Zach. And Zach has a line where he's talking about the carpuscular first pass lighting. And you see, like, Tim and Lisette, like, give each other a look real quick, and then Lisette starts laughing. So, like, just all the little ones, <laughs> or, like, you know, talking about the H poles versus cantilevers. And then Tim, at yep. some point, he's like, it's dumb. It is dumb to call it. Uh, H pole, but again, H -pole. it's one of those things like, well, from Zach's perspective, he's in an uncomfortable spot trying to be this game's stepdad, as he puts it, you know, and to have like mm -hmm. the real dad in there on the side being like, your, your words are dumb. It's like, okay, that's not helping. <laughs> that's not yeah. helping this very tight situation. Ugh. Um, let's see. Uh, Neil Smith says the shot after Ryan bluntly shut down Anna um, is quietly, oh, wait. Shut Anna down. She is quietly fidgeting while the meeting continues around her and the camera slowly pans on her. It's so relatable and harrowing. They immediately cut to her goodbye email and I wonder how much real world time passed between those moments. Thank you, Neil, for really zooming in on that stuff. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it is tough. It's interesting to see, like, to really try and gauge, you know, in those meetings. It's the same shot. It's the same interview where Anna's talking about leaving and then when she's talking about just like the nature of Zach and leadership and how yes, much he disagrees. I was, I was thinking of just like they're wearing the same clothes. Yep. This is the same day. You know, yep. they're they're doing this all sure. at the same time. So even if yeah. she says it's not one to one, you know, later on, it seems like a lot of other people are saying like, eh, if Zach wasn't here, I think I think she'd still be here. Um, yeah. Yeah. That I, I'm trying to remember. I don't remember the exact moment where Ryan bluntly shot Anna down. But yeah, it seems like Ryan can be definitely blunt at times. Yeah. And oh God, I was so fascinated by like when he came back and he's in that meeting and Ugh. When he's just like, he has that interview where he's like, look, they feel the way they feel about Zach and I can't tell them they're wrong. Like, I think they're totally right, but like, I'm going to try and do my best here. I don't really want to unpack it too much. And then there's that meeting and you could tell like Lisette is kind of trying to move things along and he's trying to jump in to be like, however, however, like, and she just like keeps on rolling. It's like, okay, there's so much in these little moments. Mm -hmm. Oh God, it's just, it's rough. Um, these butts writes in and says, 
can we give a shout out to the beautiful and constantly evolving animated intro sequences? I didn't even yes, realize they were yeah. changing each episode at first until I noticed there was one where Tim was missing from the shots. The payoff when COVID hits and we zoomed through an empty office really drove home how much it changed. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's or like all the, yeah. the crunch episode where they mm. do the like minor key intro and you're right. like, oh, this oh. one's this one's important. Oh, yes. My God. Yeah. I, yeah. Can we get that villains of crunch Mode episode nominated for something like I don't know where you honor it outside of screaming about it on an outlet like Minmax, but like that episode. Yeah, maybe we can like talk about it for a week. Okay. <laughs> the <laughs> deepest dive on the villains of crunch Mode episode. Absolutely. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, like that the COVID shot, and it's all just like the echoey kind of muted version mm-hmm. of the intro. It's like, oof. Oof. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I really enjoyed a lot of those intros. I I actually noticed it like right away, uh, oddly enough. Where it was I changing. noticed it like the sec yeah, the second episode, I was like, this is a different intro. I have right. no idea how. But and it, <laughs> yeah. it kind of it fits with the 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 thing that Ben you've said many times this week, which is like it doesn't make sense to do this. <laughs> yes, you know, yes. it's like it doesn't make sense to make a different intro for mm-hmm. every episode of this thing that people are like probably not going to watch anyway. You know, it's like mm-hmm. it doesn't. If you are trying to just get like the most bang for your buck, right? I would never do that. But that's mm-hmm. not what they're interested in, and that's part of what makes it so great. Yep. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, Dean B says, do we know what the workplace at Double Fine is like now? I'm sure some workers have stayed remote slash flex, but I'm curious how much it's like pre-COVID. The culture of that office seems so important. Yeah, it's being renovated right now, which is what two-player talked about. So I don't think anybody's in there at the moment. But yeah, I don't know if they're going to be expanding or just kind of overhauling it. You'd think they would move into a new studio or move to a new city or something. Um, yeah. But yeah, I, I guess it's we'll see what it looks like when the renovations are done. Um, but again, that's a testament to two-player productions that we care about the renovations within the office of Double Fine. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Let's see. Goose Owen says, what are y'all's funniest moments of the series? For me, it's the editing here where they zoom in on Zach's face during a meeting where James is talking, though the moment was probably innocuous in real life or whatever. The editing got me real good. Hang on. I'm going to just obnoxiously cl- Okay. So it's like a jump cut to, yeah, a blank stare from Zach um, after James was talking. Uh, yeah. Do you all have a, a funniest moment that stands out? Um... Uh, mine is when they're piling the, uh, I forget who was piling the pillows on who, um, but they just kept on adding pillows. <laughs> I was just like, this is good yes, office this stuff. This is yeah, extremely good office stuff. This is like a little brother energy thing, which I am a little, a little brother, so I totally <laughs> do this to my brother. Yeah, I it, like the, the it, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to, it's not, it's not ha ha funny, but the part where they are backstage at, I don't know, the Microsoft thing or yeah. something, and they talk about throwing the other camera person out. Yes. But, like, double fine mistakes. I was just like, you know, I was so kind of tickled by that. that <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, the Microsoft internal camera crew is right out there, but it's like, probably no, it's like no, people thought that it was a regular camera. Um, yeah, I think of, like, all those little post credits things are typically where they can really slip in something that's funny but doesn't really connect to anything else. But, like, that bit after Amnesia Fortnite where Pendleton Ward is just, this is kind of silent. Oh, yeah. Somebody says, are we alone in the universe? He's like, what? He's like, oh, I thought you said, are we allowed in the universe? <laughs> the universe. I was like, holy yeah. cow. Uh, um, and then the other one that really made me laugh is when they're pitching the Amnesia Fortnite projects. I guess it's that same episode. And Zach is in Tim's office in that one-on-one meeting. And Zach's like, okay, I'm thinking social, cooperative, warrior wear, and VR. And then Tim says... All I hear is money, 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 money. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, It turns out it's a very funny documentary. Uh, Let's see. We got Forrest with two R's who says, It was pretty painful to be dreading COVID for most of the series. I'm generally in favor of the flexible and work from home stuff, but you can definitely feel some of the creative process get lost in the changeover. And some folks like James almost completely disappear from the dock because a lot of that incidental water cooler chatting and brainstorming is held off to say nothing of crunch issues and work-life balances. I don't know a single thing about game development, aside from a special interest perspective, but I really felt immediately connected to all of them in those times, and it highlights how not all of the problems are game dev related, but some are just work in general. I felt a lot of the feelings I personally have not processed about those times too. Powering through that on top of everything else, they put this firmly put this firmly in the camp of just not knowing about creativity, but about human ingenuity and resilience in general. Mm. Yeah, it is hopefully... 50 years from now, the COBA stuff is interesting, but I feel like any documentary or news segment on it, it's always just like, I don't want to, I don't want to deal with yeah. that. So even like knowing this was coming up, it's like, okay, that as brilliant as the entire documentary is and two player, if you're listening to this tune out now, I do feel like that last episode is like a little long. I feel like it's the only time we're really kind of dragged. It's like an hour and a half of just zoom calls, you know? Yeah. And I, mm. I really wonder 
you know, like if if COVID did not happen, how many more episodes would there be? Yes, right. because mm. because it feels like and and a two player even talked about this. Like the magic thing about game development is that everything only starts working in the last you know, like one percent of the development process. Mm -hmm. And you get the sense that they're trying to communicate that. But just because Zoom calls allow them so much less flexibility. Yeah, you don't really get a sense of the game coming together. And also yeah. it's just like it's I don't know, six months for those two episodes. Like it's right. just covering more time at theoretically the most important part of development. Mm -hmm. And so I again, I agree they did a great job with like what they were able to do, mm -hmm. but it, you know, I felt like, oh, gosh, there's so much lost from the office culture. And then I had to kind of interrogate myself and be like, is that true or is it just lost from the ability to filmmake about it? You know, like uh, what's, yeah, I'm sure what is really missing here? Yeah. And they tried to have moments of levity, which I appreciate even in the Zoom era, like, you know, playing the piano and playing the Jurassic Park theme. Like there's funny stuff yeah. in there. And like, yeah, you kind of lose track of some of the people that you've been following the documentary up to that point, but also like it elevated other people. Like the guy who's playing yeah. the piano, like, who is this guy? You know, it's, it's nice that it kind of, everybody's face is on the screen at once, which is tough to do unless you're in a big group meeting, which I guess so much. Yeah. And it's is. like the, the zoom backgrounds were always funny. Yeah, they were oh, funny. Geez. I they, like, yeah, actually, it, some pretty good ones. it's, it's such a, like, it's not even a joke of filmmaking, but I just laughed at like one of the meetings early on, the guy's background was, from that CNN clip where yes. you know, the guy's daughter in. comes into the room yeah. and just like him <laughs> having that background. I was like, I'm like, great that bit. Is, <laughs> I now humor. know when this was. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. 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 <laughs> um, yeah. I liked that they had some perspective there too, where they talked about when everybody went remote, I, I assume it's the producer. I'm trying to remember who said this, but they said the first milestone after the quarantine, uh, like it was down 30 to 50%. Like mm -hmm. productivity, you know, and you got to wonder how much that changed as time went on. But it's like, OK, it's cool to hear people kind of unpacking like this works well for a lot of people. It seems to be working out for Ray in his awesome place over there in Utah. Right. It's like, I, was, yeah. I was rooting for him so hard. Like every time they showed his backyard, I'm like, oh, that looks so beautiful. I'm so happy for that, dude. <laughs> uh, but then I was like, OK, there's there's some number associated for maybe a slight down down taken productivity if you want to be a, a robot about all this stuff and well, that know. that part where all their servers went down right that was yeah. that was a uh, thrilling yeah. yeah and i don't want to tell tales out of school and whatnot like tim schaefer alluded to it and i i didn't talk about two player i probably should have but there's also a moment where the entire documentary was almost deleted thanks to final cut pro x where like oh <laughs> it, like it was i forget how they salvaged it but yeah maybe they tell it in the Wait. no clip interview i gotta go check that out um, let's see, we got uh, Shoji Kodo over there on Patreon. Thank you for your support. They say, I think two-player productions did an absolutely stellar job with this documentary. It's now quite possibly my favorite piece of gaming media ever. Yeah, I'm in that camp. Uh, while this is obviously edited down quite a bit, going from 5,000 plus hours of footage down to 22 hours in the final doc, I feel like they did a great job in terms of the transparency and capturing all aspects of game development. I think they portrayed all the individuals and teams at the studio in a fair light, showcasing the challenges they faced uh, growth and successes over the years. And while there are two sides to every coin, I think the benefit of this transparency is that it does a lot to show people just how hard game development is and it leads to being a bit more empathetic, as we talked about, yeah. All that said, if you could pick one developer and one game, past, present, future, to have a full crew like two-player productions embedded within it to film a documentary on this scale, what would you choose? Ooh. We've gotten this question a lot. It's yeah. so tough because it's yeah. like, do you want to see a really tortured one? You know, do you want like Anthem? Right. Or do you want... I mean, maybe like a huge Japanese game yeah. would be interesting. I'm trying to think about, you know, like if you could see Final Fantasy VII Remake, if you could mm, see, yeah, you know, yeah. like what what would be good to watch? But also, and I'll, I'll stop rambling, but it's like you want to see a studio where everyone can contribute because what you don't want to see is a bunch of designers deciding things and then programmers just doing it. Yep. So it like it does mm -hmm. have to be. A, a cooperative atmosphere like this. Yeah, that. Yeah, that's actually a really good point. And I like um, I like the idea of focusing on a game too that's not just beloved. So again, yeah. if you, if you're two player productions, please stop listening right now. But I would have liked to see their full documentary on Mighty Number no. Nine, which they promised, and I supported Mighty Number no. Nine and Kickstarter for it, and then it didn't come <laughs> out because of complications. But like, I think if you had a full documentary on the development of all of Mighty Number no. Nine and like what went wrong there, I think that would be fascinating. And the fact that 
a lot of that footage is out there. Like it's so frustrating, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. Uh, that's actually, you know. that's a really good question or point also is like a lot of the documentaries that like uh, of these, of this ilk uh, have like a successful game attached to it. Right. So like any game, the movie is like three successful games. Yep. yep. Um, uh, there's like the Hades documentary from no clip um, and, and like this and like, or like uh, what you call it? The Kratos uh, documentary. Yeah. And like, uh, I forget. Uh, you also uh, in an in earlier interview this week, you all or like somebody also was like, this is what it takes for like a really good game <laughs> to get uh, released. Like, yeah, I, I would also be really curious to see what a a game that people like internally believed was like, yes, this is mm-hmm. this is good. This is what we really want to do. But um but just was like critically not well received. I mean, even, or, like, you know it what? Didn't financially, S- cyberpunk, well. Jet uh, the Far Shore. Yes, mm. great choice. Yep. Oh man, great ideas. Yeah, and then everyone's just kind of like, ah, uh, maybe not so much. And they just re-released it too with like DLC. And uh, yeah. I'm waiting for like. The... Right. I mean, I think they kind of remade the loop of the game. Right. Um, right. And I, look, I beat that game, but I, yeah, I kind of feel like I should. I don't know. Do it again. I was also thinking, you know something a game that feels very like just ethereal like magical so i would love to see a last guardian yep. documentary oh, yeah, especially sure. because of how long that game took to develop and it's like how how much were they trying to figure out the artistry and how much was it just like they could not get it to run on the ps3 right um <laughs> <laughs> Oof, yeah, yeah that's probably a lot for sure of it. uh evan r asks um what do you all want to see next from two-player productions? I don't think filming another documentary on this length would be feasible, and I bet they would probably want to do something else with a shorter turnaround time anyway. Yeah, it is It is kind of a weird spot. We talked about it a little bit in that interview, but it's like, I think it's a combination of, uh, I, don't, I don't know anything, but just the idea of like, maybe this would be harder to start as a Microsoft Studios or project this big. Also, it feels like as everyone gets older, you can only take so many gigantic swings at something that's ambitious and like that... That is a mm-hmm. wild project they just pulled off. And I, yeah. I I don't think anything like this will ever be done again. And so it's maybe be, it's maybe too empathetic, which is a real problem in society. But a part of me feels like if they just make little Vidox and all the games Double Fine makes from here on out, that sounds cool. That sounds like a good life for them, <laughs> you know? Yeah, or just like really zoom in on one, just be like our E3 demo. Yeah, you know, like yeah. here's mm-hmm. here's like even you know do a six part series like you can yep. still make it big but be like here is here is one piece of it and let's look yeah. at how many how many people have to work towards this like one thing right yeah right and like actually like zoom in and uh you see all the different aspects of the development um which i do think that they do a, a pretty good job of like highlighting all the different things yeah uh, that go into it um but i would lo- like some of my favorite um parts of all of these documentaries are when like voice actors are there when music and sound and, and sound effects uh happen and stuff uh largely because or i think that's part of the or part of the reason is because that i don't or like you don't see them nearly as often um uh, in throughout the documentary and you know it's kind of hard to uh, get all of that stuff especially if it's just like yeah I'm working on um, sound effects that are definitely going to get cut uh, because they're these are totally placeholder sound effects and I am not at all caring about uh, what they are just that they are there and present and but I would be really curious to see uh, like that in the, the their thought process and, and things like that so that you can get those things of like all those like nuances and stuff for like an E3 demo, like you said. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, other thoughts, other beats that we haven't hit? I have so many little stupid notes, but I feel so obnoxious running down them. So does anybody else have anything they want to talk about that we haven't really covered? You want to talk about Notch? I forgot it completely like in that, in the oh beginning where Notch like pitched oh, like, let's make yeah. second Notch 2. was like, how did I forget that he tweeted that? And they actually like, were talking to him about maybe doing it that way. That's so wild to see. Yeah. Jesus. Uh, Man, totally double fine and notch really a, just just two cultures that could easily work <laughs> together <laughs> i mean that's how the whole thing started was you know it was uh two player productions interviewing tim schaefer about minecraft and mm-hmm. and if i may if i may have a moment 
And uh, Charles, I know you've been plugging the hell out of the HyperDot and we respect you for it. <laughs> no, you're doing a good job. You're being honest. No. You're being honest. You're doing Please a good don't. job. <laughs> no, but my, my equivalent of that is like um, two player productions back in the day when they're working on that Minecraft documentary reached out to me when I was at Game Informer. They're like, hey, do you have anybody's email at Double Fine? We're trying to get a hold of them to maybe include them in this Minecraft documentary. And I technically connected those two. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so you no. owe me. I should get millions from that acquisition is my point. Wow. Um, no, it was a small thing. I'm sure they would have found it anyway. Um, <laughs> let's see. Other things that really shouts me is like when they did that AMA, I loved like how tense that was. I feel like I could have gone for oh, a lot yeah. more on the mm. marketing side of things, like Spaff's entire angle, just seeing like, oh, an AMA. It's this opportunity for transparency and fun. And then just like, no, no, in the room, it's like battle plans. And like when Spaff was like, hey, this is your opportunity. You offended this person. You need to make this right. And it's just like, mm-hmm. you just get to see, how often do you get a documentary about somebody trying to make a snarky comment online and then being well, talked yeah. through it and coached <laughs> through it? You know, it's bizarre. And and also just the whole, you know, this disappeared fairly early, but when they were doing the crowdfunding thing and kind of remembering that like, they were kind of one of the Gamergate targets. Yes. Oh, yeah. You know, yep. and mm-hmm. and uh, Tim being like, you know, prior to this, you kind of felt like, hey, if you if you just meet an individual person and you talk to them for long enough, they can like see you as a person. Mm-hmm. And now that, that just nothing. doesn't yeah. feel like a realistic goal anymore. Yep. Yep. <laughs> it's just like, oh, yeah. Times have changed. Um, let's see. I loved hearing Jeff Keighley call to talk about the trailer. Um, yeah. when they're talking about making that trailer for the game awards and the fact that they then broke it down and they're like, yeah, the, the VGA trailer cost four weeks of production to make that happen. Oh, like, yeah, oh God, yeah. having a number for that. That's so helpful. Um, do you all mind if I just run down these? Is anyone dying? To oh, no, to wrap this? <laughs> okay. This feels so obnoxious. Um, I love that moment. God, I forget their name, but the lead on Rhombus of Ruin at uh, when they're at E3 and they're like showing it at the Sony thing and there's this great moment where he goes over to like the Sony rep and he's like, by the way, like we're, we actually want notes. Like if if you hear anybody say anything, like please write it down. You could actually uh-huh. help us. And the Sony guy's like, uh, all right. It's just, it's nice to see just like, <laughs> yeah, it's people are desperate for feedback at this point. And they'll oh. take it anywhere they can get it, you know? Uh, here's, yeah. here's a takeaway. Developing for VR looks so horrible yes i i would <laughs> never i mean you know the the fact that for one of the amnesia fortnights zach was like let's do something in vr VR. and then it's like they have to like keep putting on and off the helmet and being like does this work now looks miserable and the frame rate sucks because it's not optimized so therefore you'll just get sick every time you put it on like (laughs) yep this is actually something that i can relate to because i did vr development oh really Uh, yeah so yeah no this is this is totally a thing where like uh, I was the designated tester oh. because uh, apparently I had like an iron stomach and like <laughs> whatever it like weird things would happen where like your character like you would move forward and then your character moves backwards and it's like oh that's weird but like to me I was like it's not working uh, but everybody else that would just immediately make them sick um, <laughs> but like yeah things like that um, having to constantly turn or like put on the headset on and off yeah uh, and stuff see like um, it was actually really interesting because um, them doing all of that uh, VR development that was around the time that I also started doing VR development and stuff yeah um, and like seeing like the DK2 um, and things and Old being beauty. like wow I remember that <laughs> and having to deal with all this stuff yeah uh, that was a that was an interesting parallel that I was able able to to pull from there but like yeah no vr development is uh it's an interesting beast on top of uh itself especially depending on like the target platform that you're going on right um, right so like yeah, if you're working on like quest or something that's also another Oof. another Oof. thing you have to deal with <laughs> yeah um I, I like there was a moment where um they're talking about hiring how important hiring is double fine how long they take for hiring and all this stuff and jeremy talks mm-hmm. about like at EA, where he's at before, like they're less selective with the hires, and it seems like a good idea because he's bringing all these people, and then it results in everybody just complaining about everybody else during lunch, and then everyone just turns south. Like I thought that was such an interesting perspective. Like, well, you can go this route and bring on everybody, and then you're ruining the mood at lunch forever and <laughs> giving people just stuff to complain about. I'm like, I loved that little bit, just that little glimpse in the documentary too of like, I, it's again, what other documentary crew would include this? But it's so incredible they do of just like smoke breaks 
Naturally, oh, yeah. smoke breaks are a place where people will like unpack how they're feeling about work and like a lot of emotional stuff is being worked through during that smoke break and like there are yeah. bonds formed there that aren't forming anywhere else, you know? Yeah. And uh, speaking of smoke breaks, uh, I thought it was sweet that they kind of set it up as a tease in the beginning then paid it off at the GDC speech uh, with Tim Schafer crying where he was talking about it was Will Wright who just gave him $250,000 oh, yeah. oh, to keep yeah. Double Fine around. Yeah. Woof. I'd, oh, my God. I didn't know if... Um, because I, you know, I did not, I was not into like double fine lore before watching this. So I didn't know if that was something that like was kind of public knowledge or whatever. If I, that was. No, I think the GDC, I think was the first time they talked about it publicly. Yeah. I remember being shocked to learn that. Um, yeah. But God, what a, what a move. And I like yeah. too how he went out of his way to be like, don't ask him for money now. Don't ask him for money now, everybody. It's <laughs> oh, yeah, not going to work please. again. Yeah. Um, that was nice. um, also, here, here's something that I, I wondered when they were talking about running out of money and it's like, you know, uh, two player, very good at not inserting themselves into the narrative. But if I was them, I'd be like, well, we're the first people getting cut. Right? <laughs> right. <laughs> so like, uh, the full time documentary staff. You right. Know what I mean? mm -hmm. But then it's like, well, you've then you're wasting so many people's hours in retrospect. If they spent hundreds and hundreds of hours doing these interviews, and the documentary just never comes out. It's like that's the right. development time wasted. Would, like, yeah. yeah. Oh, 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 my man. God. Um, that would be a whole thing. Real beautiful judo flip 180. I forgot about this moment from E3 where after the acquisition, Jack Black and Tim Schafer are at that panel and they're talking about, um, you know, getting acquired by Microsoft and Jack Black, I think, made some Bill Gates joke and some asshat from the crowd's like, where did he touch you? And there's like an awkward beat and then Tim Schafer just goes, in the wallet. <laughs> and it's like, yeah. it's just like an amazing <laughs> joke. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Um, maybe this is every studio and every developer but i want a super cut please somebody out there make the super cut of every time zach does a little cheeky like uh making video games or hey that's a video game folks like every time he's developing a game and he says like we're yeah, video like, game in here like yeah. that comes up so much and it just nails <laughs> on a chalkboard to me but you know oh, whatever that's pretty good uh oh that moment oh Again, this is just amazing where Tim is talking to Zach about like, I think it's the sound of like a ledge grab in a platformer and how important that mm -hmm. is. And I think Zach's mm -hmm. like, I don't really know what you're talking about. And Tim's like, no, it, no, it's like an important part of platformers. It's like the sound of a ledge grab. And then it's just like, this is early on, but it, the episode ends with Tim just kind of like, it sounds like this. And he like firmly puts his hand on Zach's shoulder, I think. And like, that's how the episode ends. But it's just like emphasizing that moment of like, Here's a little physical push, like a little, it's not like he's taking a swing at him, but like it has 5% of that energy and like based on all these other kind of tense meetings and just kind of uncomfortable discussions between those two in particular. Um, mm -hmm. I, I have done this myself. Oh, sorry. Go okay. ahead, Charles. Oh, uh, I, I uh, did remember a moment. <clears throat> and I, I mean, it's like, it's like the climax of the entire thing. Well, I, I guess it's a re resolution of the entire thing. Um, the end where Tim uh, Tim is basically, you know, congratulating everybody and then says that you made somebody's favorite game of all time. Right. Yep. Yeah. Like that. And I'm like me. I've never been in a position where even when, like releasing a game or something like that, I've never been in a position where I have like I could say, yeah, I've made somebody's favorite game of all time. I bet hyper and, like, since somebody's favorite game of all time. Well, I see. That's the thing where I'm like, I don't know whether or not I would. I would be able to like confidently say that before I released Hyperdot. Right. I would be like, oh yeah, I totally make a, made a great game. Like I felt proud and and whatnot, but like I never felt like that confident right. in it. And like the fact that he felt like, no, I am confident that somebody is like that. And and like you, you like you all have made something that is like that level of good. Um, that is something that I like me personally like. I would want to strive to be like, oh, yeah, yeah I want to be yeah. able to create something to that effect where I'm like, yeah, I'm confident that this could be somebody's favorite you game can do of it. all time. We believe um, in you, if I can, If I can be uh, obnoxious for a Please. moment, um, you don't believe it, uh, basically. It's like, like I've had people tell me that like videos that I've made are like their favorite video, and I'm just kind of, my brain is like, no, it's not. You know, like right, I just, right. I just kind of like it's, it's very nice to hear, but I'm just like, 
the problems that I see this thing with this thing are going to prevent me from believing that it is someone's favorite, even if they are like telling it to me. Uh, sure. So it's uh, striving to accept uh, praise <laughs> is as important yeah. as as getting it. <laughs> uh, let's see other odds and ends. Um, okay, I I have done this myself, um, so I I connect with it. But there's that meeting where they're talking about like who's going to work on the quote unquote Lisa Frank level, um, and like uh, Emily should work on this. It was her idea, but Zach was like, ah, let's just get it done. I don't really want to bring Emily. And it seemed to be the tone is a little unclear for why, and so he just kept going around the table asking. Like, who do you think should work on this? Who do you think should work on this? And I was like, Emily, Emily. And he's like, okay. And he just like, keeps calling in people till he gets to get the answer that he wants. You know, like, I, mm -hmm. I feel like I do that all the time for just like trying to plan out mid max content. Like, okay, yeah, but what if I just kept <laughs> yeah, going till I got the answer I wanted? You know, it's like, ugh, it's, it sucks, <laughs> but it's human, I guess. Um, the, <laughs> ugh, the moment where uh, James says diluted in a meeting, and then Zach says it's diluted, not oh, diluted. Yeah. They're, they're different. And then James just says, sorry, dad. And like, yep. you see Tim Schafer like shoot Zach a look that's just like, what are you doing? Like <laughs> diluted yeah, and like... diluted is the level that we're at. Like, it's just, oh, again, that little moment mm -hmm. is just encapsulating so much. And that there is, if I was, if I was Jacob Geller, if I was Jacob Geller and making a video on YouTube, um, if only I made YouTube content, like I, there is, there is a read on this entire documentary that is about like parenting or like parenting in San Francisco. Like there is so much mom and dad talk throughout this entire documentary. Maybe it's too Freudian to really zoom in, but there's so much stuff about just like, oh, you're the stepdad. I'll always be the game stepdad. Ryan was the mom. The designers are orphans. I think uh, Emily right. says after oh, they yeah, leave was, and stuff. Awesome. There is huh. so much mom and dad stuff throughout this entire thing. And also just like, you know, with the entire documentary being about authority, like there's there's something there. I'm not going <laughs> to unpack it, but I think it's interesting. Um, let's see. Other things. Oh, when they had that meeting and Zach wasn't in it, and then he came to him, he's like, what the hell? What are you doing with this meeting? I'm like, I don't know. It was on the calendar. And he's like, well, why didn't anybody tell me? He's like, well, it was on the calendar. I don't know. And it's just like good office mm -hmm. place miscommunication. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and then mm -hmm. Zach trying to be jokey about it. He's like, okay, let's turn these cameras off. And he's like, bleh, and like flips them off, like yeah. trying to be jokey. But it's like, you can tell for real, like, enough of this. I'm done with this documentary. <laughs> Nonsense. Well, that's, yeah, those, those moments, I was both, I was glad they were included, but I also do think they like broke the documentary a little bit mm -hmm. because it was revealing like people are conscious of being filmed. Oh, you know, right. and, yeah. and there were, there were like, jokes that people would make that were like kind of inappropriate and then they'd be like there was a joke about like drinking um where they were talking about like making like an alcoholic level yes. or something and yeah. they made something oh, yeah. and then someone was like oh well that's in the documentary now or whatever and you got the sense that it's like maybe the humor is like a little more coarse when cameras are not actively filming yeah. or something i'm sure i'm sure yeah but there's still plenty of stuff that's like you know if they really were worried about it, it's like, okay let's trim out us laughing at walrus is masturbating there's plenty of stuff where it's like you know maybe now it doesn't look good or five years from now it won't look good but it's still in there and i really appreciate that yeah um, i'm i'm like really appreciative that there's stuff in here that make people not look uh like the like knight in shining armor mm -hmm. kind of thing like mm -hmm. they're just always perfect uh, and stuff and like that that is one thing that i have appreciated a lot about the the documentary just in general yeah um is that like for everybody yeah sometimes they're not in, not shown in the best light God, um, i mean you you think about how how hard it would be to be two player and like have personal relationships with all these people yep, and then yep. put that stuff in of just like you know there's there is i, I think they did an incredible job i don't have you know like problems with its uh, transparency but like there's a reason that journalists don't write articles about their friends you know like that's that is like a a thing that is really hard to do yep. and so mm -hmm. i i'm very impressed with the amount of imperfection they put in there because yeah. like that just gets harder and harder when you you're going to go to work and see that person. <laughs> yep. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's the yeah. almost famous syndrome, you know, like uh, I think even Emily, uh, she has that line where she's like, are you going to be friends with everybody uh, after you release this documentary? <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and then when Ryan is leaving, 
um, and things are a little bit tense. He has that interesting line where he's looking at two player and he goes, I'll miss you guys. <laughs> it's like how he phrases it. It's like, oh my God. Yeah. So brutal. Um, on, on the, you know, showing everybody and all their perspectives, it is like one of those moments. Where, okay, here's the strength is every meeting with a publisher like Starbreeze or Microsoft, I guess, yeah, Microsoft, like mm -hmm. Zach, I think is really good. And like, you can see other people in the room, mm -hmm. maybe I'm projecting, but you see them kind of like appreciating like, oh, he is nailing this. Like every phrase he uses, like I think at some point early on, he's talking to Starbreeze and he's like, He's like, we're so far along. Like, I'm feeling more confident about this game than any other game we've ever worked on. And I think even Tim yeah. has a moment of like, ooh, that's good. Like, he's really <laughs> nailing it. So it's like, everyone has their strengths. Um, yeah. That said, uh, another thing that I was, you know, it's implied from everything we've talked about, but like, I, I genuinely am struggling. I mean, maybe being lowered into a volcano, but I'm struggling to think of many things on earth worse than seeing YouTube comments talking about, or like online arguments talking about me being let go from a company. Like from Zach's perspective. Yep. And again, sure. not to make the yeah. hero villain dichotomy, but like, I really hope he has stayed completely unplugged because can you imagine that? Like how sensitive that would be? And I know a lot of angles are sensitive here. I understand that. But like just yeah. thinking about that in particular, it's like, God, mm -hmm. that'd be brutal. I yeah. thought one of actually I was thinking about this earlier. Um, one of one of the most interesting moments is the, you know, the episode after he's let go where they are getting like contacted by press yeah and a yep. tim says like they want to riot games exactly. and that's not what happened here and just like the awareness of like mm -hmm. here is how people want to write this story right you know and and then again two player making this thing being like this is how people are going to want to tell this story or whatever yeah. and uh yeah i <laughs> yeah and and then also you know acknowledging like everyone's feelings you know it's like well you also don't want to make you don't want to make it too even-handed if everyone yeah. is like this was a bad time so it's it, it is an mm -hmm. impossible tightrope that i would not want to walk and i also would not want to be uh reading comments about myself no yeah that oh my God. like that sounds um that's uh, it just sounds horrible yeah just yeah. oh absolutely um okay last little note i have um <laughs> this is this is tough, but like, you know, that moment where then later on in development, after so much stress with level design and game design, just overall production, and like, we need somebody to make these calls, um, and then rejecting that authority, that kind of thing. there's a point later on where James, the level designer, he says, you know, it sucks to have to design something, then also have to decide whether it's good enough. <laughs> it's like, oh my God, so it sucks both ways. It's just like, again, there's just that nuance of like, yeah, it sucks to be told it's not good enough. And then, you know what? I don't want to make that call. That sucks. It's like, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, it's tough. It's tough for everybody out there. Um, that's it. I, I still have a lot of random odds and ends, but I think, I think, I think I've, I'm starting to get my feelings about Double Fine Psych Odyssey uh, off my chest at this okay. point. Uh, I'm glad that we were able to help you uh, work through your feelings. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank no you. Problem. And I hope we haven't lost too many Patreon supporters because of it. And thanks, everybody, for, for watching. Like, it really it warms well, my the heart. The problem is we don't make enough other content. MinMax, really, it doesn't put out enough uh, right. other videos, podcasts, Deepest Dives, etc. Yeah, that doesn't make any sense. Yeah, so. we could do it. I, I mean, this is something we can unpack on Party Chat, our bonus podcast. But I've been thinking about it a lot with this week because, like, we're kind of pushing the lever all the way to the floor for content this week. And it's like... If we don't get a boost in any way from this, it's just that nice moment of just like, and I'm not saying we need to, you know, but it's that moment of just like, you got to be smart and not burn yourself out. I understand that. It's a lesson from the documentary even, you know, it's just that weird thing of like, if we're pushing this hard for this much content in one week and it's like no number moves, what's it? worth but look these are party chat discussions this is this isn't for max spoilers it's not the right time or place look for it. here's the lesson that you learned from it sometimes you do things because uh they're good and not yes. because they make any financial sense that's exactly it that's exactly it it. double fine psych odyssey everybody tell your friends go watch it uh thanks everybody for supporting us on patreon and submitting those comments for everybody that has watched along and everybody who's watching a documentary about game development for maybe the first time even it's sweet to get all that feedback about it um so i'm happy to keep coasting off the wild success of Double Fine Psych Odyssey and just hang out <laughs> behind him and talk about it. Yeah, I agree that thing's good. Uh, but uh, Charles McGregor, thank you for being here, sir. Um, no, if people want more of your work and more of you, where should they go? Yeah, uh, you can follow me on Twitter at DarkHazeTG. Uh, you can also follow me on YouTube. Uh, I've started a YouTube channel uh, at DarkHazeTG, I guess. Sweet. Uh, now, there's a, now there's a link that you can do. 
So yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, uh, and then uh, uh, you can like play my games and and whatnot. Yeah. Also at Dark Ace TG on itch and steam is there's not a link so i'd have to say go play hyperdot <laughs> yeah hell yeah go play hyperdot it rules jacob geller what's going on sir uh yeah listen to the podcast something rotten uh oh, where yeah. blake hester and i are done covering the manhunt series a wild uh a wild odyssey of its own uh we will be starting our new season soon uh, and then you can watch my videos on youtube jacob geller Sweet. All right. That's it, everybody. Thanks so much for watching or listening to this Max Spoilers. Is this the end of Double Fine Psych Odyssey content? You tell us, or we'll tell you, perhaps, later today. All right. Thanks so much, everybody. Goodbye. Bye. You've seen the headlines. You know that the media landscape is consolidating. Having truly independent games media is more important than ever. MinMax can exist independently as a place about games, friends, and getting better, but we need your help. The good news is that it's easy. Just click on that subscribe button or unlock a mountain of benefits by going to patreon.com slash minmax with two N's. Thanks so much, everybody.